everybody ready to roll? All right, guys. So if you will, um, for my folks at home, I think my folks in here in the classroom have already done it, but go to your modules and to this week's module, click on the history of the atom right here. And then we have instructions for how to do a jam board. Jam board is something I've just learned about. It's a pretty cool little deal. But click on make a copy of this jam board. And let me get that out of your way. And over here um, in the top right, there's the, some people call this a snowman. Uh, it's three dots in a row. If you click on that and then go down to the bottom and hit make a copy, you get to make your own copy of this that you can edit. And um, the instructions for how to do this is here. It says, it says do not move me. It definitely should say do not move. I apologize for that. Uh, do not move. You can see what was on my mind. I'll move you a better way. Um, do not move the titles at the top. So ancient Greek, first atomic theory, plum pudding, little nut, orbital model, and modern theory are kind of our headings. And so what we're going to do throughout the day today is take our scientists, our atomic models, and our six descriptions and put them where they belong. If you need to zoom in to be able to read the words, you can just click right over here and click on maybe 100%, make everything bigger, and then you can just move around and kind of kind of go as we go. Sound good? All right, so I'm gonna leave, just kind of slide this out of the way so everybody can see nice and pretty, and we'll come back to this. And what we're gonna do we're in order from oldest to newest. Obviously, ancient Greek starts at the beginning. Modern period where we're going to end. Anytime we do any of these, I'll kind of take a pause and explain kind of where we're at with each one. All right. So we're going to start off with the first spot, which is the ancient Greeks. The ancient Greeks didn't know anything about modern chemistry. So they didn't have the tools that we have today to actually do the thing. So when I talk about the, the, the ancient Greeks, I'm not necessarily talking about scientific method. What I'm talking about really is philosophy or thought processes, okay? So about 400 BCE before the common era or before Christ, depending on how you're gonna look at it, but 400 years before Christ, you had these Greeks. And the main one, Lucifer is sort of important, but the one that's on your paper, you can go ahead slide it in the right spot is Democritus. So you're going to slide Democritus over there to the underneath the ancient Greeks. Go ahead and grab him, slide him over there to the ancient Greeks. And let's see what, what he did. So th the story behind Democritus isn't on the notes here, but the story behind Democritus is that he had this story. And the story was he would take a seashell and break it. And then he could take the broken piece and break it again. And then he can take the broken piece and break it again. And he posited, his theory was that you get to, get to a certain point where you couldn't break it anymore. And when you got to that point that you, weren't, you couldn't break it anymore, you had something that was so small that makes everything. And he said, you eventually get down to a point where things are indivisible. That's a word I'm going to use a bunch today. And it's a word we say every day. And I want to make sure we understand what it means. What does indivisible mean? First thing we need to know is that it's not invisible. What does invisible mean? You can't see it. Indivisible is a little bit different. When do we say it every single day? When do we say the word indivisible every single day you're at school? One nation under God, indivisible. Everybody with me? Okay, why do we say indivisible when we say the Pledge of Allegiance? Because where do we live? The United States, where the, the, the um, Pledge of Allegiance was written right after what war? Any guesses? What war were we almost not a United States? The war. Everybody with me? The Civil War fighting against each other right after that they wrote the pledge of allegiance because we are one nation indivisible you cannot divide it you cannot break it apart 
So one nation indivisible. So let's talk about Democritus. Democritus said you got to a point where matter was indivisible. You could get so small you couldn't break it again. And the Greek word that he used was atomos, brain. Matter is discontinuous. He used that word atomos, and his model was of an atom was a solid sphere. You get to a point for all matter where you can't get any smaller. So really what Democritus did for us was he came up with that word atomos, atom. Okay, so we got the name, French and Greek. I think we got the model, right? There's actually two of them that look the same because two of them are gonna have the same model. Everybody with me on that? And then do we see the description I just said? Atomos with a seashell. So you should have three things under ancient Greek. Everybody cool? All right, so let's keep on rolling. 400, I'm gonna do math real quick. Uh, I'm gonna do that about, about 2,100 years later, you had the real true beginnings of modern chemistry, you know, about, about 150, 200 years ago. Antoine Lavoisier, which, who is not on your paper, is known as the father of chemistry. He started a lot of these things that we use for modern chemistry. He actually wrote a book that was the beginning, the real, the first chemistry book. And he came up with this idea of the law of conservation of mass. And what that means is the matter on earth today is the same as the matter on earth that has always been. Every time you have an atom, that atom used to be something different. Okay, you're made of four elements really. Another, mostly other things, but mostly what we're made of is number six, carbon, number seven, nitrogen, number eight, oxygen, and number one, hydrogen. That's 98% that's of our body are those four elements. Where does the carbon that makes our body come from? No, we, we breathe in what from the air? Let's do that. Oxygen, so the oxygen in our body came from the air. Where did the carbon and the hydrogen come from in our body? Go ahead. Water, maybe you can get some hydrogen from that, but there's no carbon in water. Yeah, the glucose and the food we eat, it's where we get our carbon and our oxygen. So you ever heard your mama say, you are what you eat? Okay, that's kind of true. When you eat food, we just ate food, our body's gonna process those atoms and those atoms are gonna get remade into us. And so the atom that is making up your skin cell you know, six months ago, might have been making up a cow skin cell that you ate off the skin of a, or the, 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 the trimmings of a steak or something like that, or a hot dog or something like that. Okay. So all the matter in the universe has always been there. We conserve, we save matter. Now, this wasn't a big important step in the atom, but it did kind of keep leading down this, this way. Then you had a man named Joseph Proust. So the proof, once again, not on your paper, so no stress, said, came up with the law of definite proportion. And what that means is every compound has a fixed proportion. You said water a second ago. What is water? H2O. For every O, there are how many H's? Two. H2O. For every O, there are two H's. For every two H's, there is one O. We breathe out CO2. For every one C, there are two O's. Okay? It's impossible to find a molecule of water that's one or that, that's two H's and 1.5 O's. Or three H's and 3.7 O's. You can't have a part of an atom. And so that led us to our first atomic theory. First atomic theory is a man named John Dalton. Okay, we got a heading. What's our heading? First atomic theory. We got a man's name? John Dalton. John Dalton. So we're, all, we're halfway there, right? Because you only need two more things, the model and the description. So John Dalton in 1803, we're talking 217 years ago, this man came up with the first atomic theory, the law of multiple proportions. When you have two different compounds that have the same two elements, equal mass of one element results in integer multiple mass of another. Yuck. Obviously, that's not on your paper because this is a bunch of yuck up here. 
This is what I want you to notice about what's up here. These words right here. Now let's take it to math class just a little bit. What's that word mean? No, 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 bring it. Give me a simple definition. Give me one word. An integer is a, a number, okay? Now, but look, we gotta do better than that because an integer is a number that is not a what? Very good. An integer is a whole number that's not negative and not zero. Everybody with me? Okay, an integer is a whole number. And so what Dalton was saying here is pretty much the same thing Democritus was saying, just a whole lot more sciencey. He was saying that there's, it's impossible to get 0.5 of something. It's impossible to get 1.78 of something. You either have the atom or you don't. Integer multiple. You either got one or you don't. There's not a decimal of having an atom. Okay? And this was the first atomic theory. And it's just showing you examples of that, the ratios and how that works. Right? But these are the first three things for the very first atomic theory. First thing, elements are made of, there's that word again, indivisible particles called atoms. Any guesses on what model I'm about to, I'm about to draw, drag to Dalton? No, nah. because if you see a plus sign in the middle of it, you can see different parts of it. If something is indivisible, that means that nothing is smaller. Go ahead. Don't, don't be wrong. Don't worry about it. It's the other one that looks just like what? It looks it exactly it looks the same because two of them are exactly the same. It's the one that looks just like democracies, right? He said it was indivisible, so it's just a straight up sphere. It's an indivisible sphere. Now, it looks like a circle on your paper because it's, I'll show you, I'm sorry. It looks like a circle on your paper because it is um, flat, but it's got a little shading there to try to make it look like a sphere. So, so far, we've, we've taken Democritus, that, and one of those over there. First atomic theory is also going to be the little purple or blue sphere because he said these guys were indivisible. Right. Second thing, atoms of the same element are exactly alike. In particular, they have the same mass. And you look almost right. If you got oxygen, you got oxygen. But we did come up with something we talked about last week where you can have a different number of neutrons. You could be an isotope. So number two is not exactly right. And number one, we're about to tear apart. Number three, though, compounds are formed by joining atoms of two elements in a fixed and the whole number ratio. There's that word again integers, whole number. This one still, this part of his 220 year old theory still stays with us today. You can't have part of an atom. You either got it or you don't. Am I cool? So John Dalton, do we find his definition? Anybody see it? The three parts of the atomic theory, indivisible, um, all atoms of the element are the same. If you can't find it, you can always come back to it because the other ones might be easier to find. And so there's his model there, same as what you had on the other one. But we, have, we know atoms are divisible, and we know we got isotopes, so we blew up that, but we're keeping, we keep the third part of his theory. So the next thing that has to happen to break down John Dalton's atomic theory and to go to the next step in the history of the atom is we got to find things that are smaller than an atom. And to do that, we have to have a way to see an atom. And this is where this man named William Crookes came in. Now, William Crookes, not on your paper, no stress, because he didn't really work with atoms. What he worked was he developed this CRT, a cathode ray tube. And pretty much what it was is he took these glass blown things and he sucked all the air out. What do you create when you get rid of all the air out of the glass? Go ahead. Not if you get all the air out inside of what's in the glass. If I, if I remove all the air out of a container, what's inside of it? 
Nothing. You're creating a vacuum. So if I can create a vacuum, I can make particles go across that vacuum and not run into anything. And he was able to light up these rays of light and to be able to see these particles as they cross this vacuum. Now, you, you might not realize it, but this is the technology that they made TVs with for 50 or 60 years. Now, the TV, none of, all the TVs you guys got now are not CRT TVs because they're the flat screens, the LCDs. But if you got a grandmama or a mama or somebody, maybe you got an old TV at your house that's real big and heavy and has a, and has a glass front that's kind of curved, that is a CRT TV. Inside of it, you have these vacuums that are just shooting light towards the screen. Now, what's the, what does this got to do with apps? I said to, for our next step, we had to be able to see this stuff. And so this was a way that you could see atoms. And then this is where radar screens come from, your TVs that are big boxes, and your old computer screens too that have the big box on the back. None of these new computer screens are like that, but your old computer screens and TVs are CRTs. J.J. Thompson took William Crooks, he took his work and made it into something about atoms. He created this cathode ray tube where he could shoot atoms across and watch what they did when he did it. So he shot atoms across and it went in a straight line. All the atoms went across the tube in a straight line and he couldn't see them because they're tiny, but what he could do is he had this phosphorescent screen that would give him a little dot showing him where the atoms hit. And so he could see whether or not the atom was going straight or not. And it's a vacuum, so they should go straight. Then he put a battery across the tube with a positive end on one side and a negative end on the other side. Now, if atoms are indivisible and they're just solid masses, this shouldn't change anything and they should keep on going straight. But as soon as he turned the battery on, the light bent. The light bent and the, 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 rate, the stream of particles as soon as they hit those positives and negatives, they took a little turn and they went so that the light changed. So if you can change something, there must be something you can do to make it different. So if Dalton was right, then there's nothing indivisible, there's nothing smaller than that solid particle. It should have kept on going. But that electric field actually made the atoms change. So J.J. Thompson said, there must be something inside these atoms that are smaller than atoms. And since they went to the positive thing, he said they probably were what is attracted to positive. Things that are, come on guys, blanks attract. Like or opposite. Like things attract, opposite things attract. Y'all never heard opposites attract? Goodness gracious, that's an old Janet Jackson song. Not Janet Jackson, uh, what's that girl that was on American Idol? Paul Abdul. That's an old Paul Abdul song, opposites attract. Watch that YouTube video when you get a chance. But opposite things attract, bam, okay? So if it went to the positive, J.J. Thompson said there must be little things that are negative. And so his cousin, Lord Kelvin, made this a full theory. There must be negative particles. There must be electrons. And what he said was that the atom has to be neutral, but it's got negative parts. And so what he said was you had this large positive mass with little negatives inside it. I don't really like this picture. I like my picture better that I have on the internet. And, and so you'll have to figure out which it is, but let's talk about it like this right here. This is a crappy name for a model. And I know that's on the, everybody see that head, heading now? The plum pudding model? This is a crappy name for a model, why? Ex exactly, more than that, what the heck is plum pudding, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody in here ever ate plum pudding? All right, so, so I don't like the name plum pudding, but I, I use it because that was what historically went with it. I got a better name because you, nobody in here has ever eaten plum pudding, but I guarantee you, even if you haven't eaten it, you've seen a chocolate chip cookie. 
So if you want to put your little text box underneath plum pudding, you can. Another way to think about this is the chocolate chip cookie. Oh, there's really only two parts to a chocolate chip cookie. What? The chocolate chips and the cookie dough. Okay. So what we have here, we got a chocolate, we got a cookie that is positive. And in that positive mass, you got these chocolate chips and a negative. Anybody see the picture? Anybody see the picture? The big positive mass and the negative things inside of it? Okay. And so what the Thompson said was, this was huge. You know, this was only about 40 or 50 years after John Dalton came up with the first atomic theory. And J.J. Thompson, along with his cousin, William Thompson, said, no, there's actually things smaller than atoms. They're called electrons. And they're like the plums in plum pudding, which 150 years ago made sense because everybody's sitting around eating plum pudding. But now, it's like the chips in a chocolate chip cookie. Am I cool? You figured it out? Okay, let's carry on. And there's a picture of plum pudding. It looks kind of looks kind of like a jello mold. Kind of like like a like a like a fruit salad almost. But oh well. Chocolate chip cookie mold. All right, now this one's also not on your paper. This is a little aside. Late 30s, James Chavik actually discovered neutrons. They kept things stable. And there's lots of other things that are smaller than an atom. Quarks, muons, positrons, neutrinos, freons, Higgs boson particles. whoop de doo We don't care about them. Let's go. We care about protons, neutrons, and electrons. This is what we call a uh, bubble chamber where they shoot atoms through and all of the, everything that scatters is actually something different. So we've gone way beyond that cathode ray tube, and we know there are lots of things smaller than an atom. So Thompson was right. Then you hit this next step. Ernest Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford did not buy that an atom was a positive mass. He said that that doesn't make sense to me because if atoms are this solid positive mass, then everything would be so much more dense. And so what Rutherford did was he set up this, probably my favorite experiment in all of chemistry. It's a really, really cool experiment. He did the same thing that um, the Thompsons did where he had a beam of light. But well, a beam of particles, not light, a beam of particles. And instead, going through a vacuum as well, but instead of catching on a phosphorescent screen, he made a circle screen and created this gold foil or gold leaf. Now, he used gold because gold is really, really malleable. I remember that word from a couple weeks ago? What does malleable mean? Mr. Steinman, you remember? What does it mean? What's the root word of malleable? Mallet. What's a mallet? It's not a hammer. Okay. Malleable means you can hit it with a hammer and it doesn't break. Gold is super malleable. You can take a hammer to gold and keep hitting it over and over and over again, and it'll never break. It'll just keep getting flatter. Okay. And so you can make this super. Anybody seen the Mr. Beast episode where he ate the, the gold pizza? Well, you check it out. And Mr. B.C. eats the gold pizza. It's pretty wild. But what they do there is they're putting gold foil that's super, super, super thin on top of the pizza. So it's like you can see the gold, but it's so small you're not really eating it. I mean, it's just there, but it's just really, really, really thin. And what he did was he made this wall of gold. But it was really thin because he, want, he wanted it to be a solid wall, but he wanted it to be a thin wall. And he shot his particles at the wall. Now, if the toxins were correct, Every time you shoot particles at a wall, if you have this solid mass of positive, what are the particles going to do? They might stick or they'll probably bounce straight back. Everybody cool? They, they'll hit it, they might go down, they might go back, but they'll probably bounce straight off. What he found out though, when he turned his machine on, is that most of the particles actually went through the wall of gold. Now, I told you this was probably one of my favorite experiments because it reminds me of Flash. Y'all know who Flash is? Running fast? 
One of the things that the Flash, I don't know if he ever did it in the TV show or the movies, but in the comics, one of the things the Flash could do was get his atoms vibrating at the same speed as the wall and run through a wall. That's, what? Yeah, because he, he can control how fast his particles are moving, so he moves his particles at the same speed as the wall and just runs right through the wall. Okay? This is what happened in here, but it's real. This isn't the Flash. This isn't science fiction. This isn't fake. The particles actually went through the wall. Now, some of them it did get deflected and went back, but most of them went straight through. Now, um, Daniel, hold up your atom for me. Okay, I got my atom here. Daniel's the wall of gold, and I'm the part. Where am I going to go to go straight past Daniel? Am I going to hit him straight on? No, because then I'll bounce straight back, right? So where, where can I go to go past him? Yeah. So when these atoms started going to you, like, when these atoms started going towards the wall, they kind of just went around everything. And so he said, most of the atoms, what did I hit when I went past Daniel just then? I hit 50 studies. And so what Rutherford said was that most of the atom is actually made up of empty space. Now, here's what really blow your mind here, guys. If most of the atom is made up of empty space, what are you made of? What are you made of, though? Atoms, right? And so if you're made of atoms, and most of the atoms empty space, you are mostly, you're already ahead of me, empty space. And so if you touch somebody, technically you're not touching them. It's your empty space touching their empty space and pushing them back. Most of the atom is empty space. Now, the, he had to deal with the positive particles, so he dealt with, with, with Thompson's idea of that big positive chocolate chip cookie with the idea that all the positive particles are at the center. And look at, look at your headings. What do you think he called the center? The little nut. The little nut. And what word means literally the little nut? The nucleus. The nucleus. Rutherford was the definition. It was the discovery of the nucleus of the atom. Now, used to be folks would take biology first, then come to me. And so I had to tell them that the nucleus in biology class was different, and it is. So biology class, this is a cell, and this is the nucleus. Inside this cell and inside this nucleus are billions and billions of atoms which have their own little tiny nucleus. So just because it's the same word doesn't mean it's the same thing. Make sure you understand that. Biology class nucleus is way bigger than chemistry class nucleus. Negative particles over and around the nucleus. Do we see the model? With the positive things in the middle and the negative particles just kind of zooming around and, and all over the place. I got to look at it. I think it's the one that looks like a classic atom. Oh, never mind. I, I, I chose a different one. The red and green one. Okay. Yep. You got you got negative particles around, and then the red particles in the middle. Found a good description. Gold foil experiment. There it is. Y'all cool? All right. So we, we get four out of six, only two left. The next step was this man named Niels Bohr. If I can find my mouse. Where's my mouse? The next step was this man named Niels Bohr. So this review, we had Dalton. I don't like that picture. Then we have Rutherford. The electrons are out there. The nucleus is in the middle. And the nucleus is really, really what? Well, incredibly. If you, if, you, if you had an atom the size of ECU's football stadium, Downey Ficklin Stadium at ECU, the nucleus would be in the middle, and it would be the size of a grain of sand. That's the difference in the size of an atom and the size of a nucleus. All right, Max Planck was huge, but not necessarily for chemistry. He said that you can, energy can only be certain amounts. He quantized energy. You can only have certain amounts. You can, it's kind of like what we said about the amounts. You can either have one or two, you can't have 1.5. Same thing here with energy. You can either have one amount or two amount, you can't have one and a half amount. 
And so Niels Bohr, 1913, only about 110 years ago, and just as a young dude here, came up with this idea that electrons are energy. And if what Max Planck is saying is right, if electrons are energy, then electrons aren't just any old where outside of the atom, outside of the nucleus, they must be in specific orbits. Now, this is where we get into my, my, my merry-go-round. And you guys are just getting to the point, I don't think you guys remember the merry-go-round in Aiden Park before they tore it down and changed up the park. Right there by the tennis court. Y'all might have been, mm, this is about four, five, six years ago, so y'all probably little bitty things. Okay, but right beside the tennis court in Aiden Park, they used to have a merry-go-round thing where you, you get on it and spin it around and around really fast. And, and anybody, maybe, maybe, maybe you've got a little bit of recognition. I'm going to be teaching this class in about four or five years. Nobody's going to know what I'm talking about. I'm going to bring up a picture of it. Okay. But one of the coolest things they had, and also the reason that they don't have it anymore, is a death trap. Oh, my goodness gracious. There's so many broken collarbones and, and all kinds of mess from that thing. Because you start spinning really fast, what's going to happen? You're going to fly off, right? <laughs> Especially if you get your older cousin or somebody up there spinning around, and you're <laughs> hanging all off the side. Okay, now if you get scared on the merry-go-round and you want to go slow, where do you need to stand? Very middle. So when it's spinning around, you're barely turning around. Okay, whereas if you want a wild ride, where do you get? Hanging off the edge. Okay, because you're going as fast as can be. Same things happening with the atom. Atoms that have, or excuse me, electrons that have low energy are going to be where? In the middle, close to the nucleus. Electrons that have high energy out on the edges. And what Niels Bohr said is that you can only have a certain amount. And so he came up with the orbital model or the planetary model. So you can either be here or here. You cannot be here. You cannot be there in the middle. So we have the orbital model. We have Niels Bohr. We got a good picture of it too. Everybody figure out which one that one is. And then, so you either have that energy or that energy, you can't have the energy in the middle. And this is still kind of the basis for how we teach chemistry today. Now, this is more than a hundred years ago and chemistry's changed a lot, but let's look at where we've been since then. So the next model, the last model, is the electron cloud model, the charge cloud model, the quantum, quantum mechanical models. And it's probably the hardest one to understand. And it's probably the one in that picture doesn't, I like the picture on your paper better than this picture. Everybody figure out there's only one left, right? There's only one left, but we haven't got to the man's name yet. Now, what's the man's name that you have left? Schrodinger. Anybody ever heard of Schrodinger? How about Schrodinger's cat? Oh, man. Okay, so what these guys said, got a bunch of guys here. Schrodinger, and I spelled Schrodinger wrong. That's Mr. Salibi's fault. Whatever. Uh, Schrodinger, Pauli, Heisenberg, Dirac, all of these guys working together on this quantum mechanical model. And sure, you're fine. We're going to be done in about two or three minutes if you don't just wait. We're going to be done in just a second. Okay. Um, but what Schrodinger said, Schrodinger actually had a fun one. Heisenberg was lazy. We'll talk about Heisenberg. I'll give you here in a second. But Schrodinger said, had this idea of, of, of this thought experiment with the Schrodinger's cat. Okay? And you can tell somebody you know about Schrodinger's cat now. What his idea was is that you've got a box. And it was more philosophy than science, but it's fun to think about. you got a box and you put a cat in it. And you put poison in it. Poison, cat, box. And you seal it. And you ask the question, is the cat alive? The answer is yes and no. Until you open that box, both things are true. Does that make sense? Because yes, the cat's alive because it was alive when I closed it. No, the cat's not alive because it might have eaten that poison, right? Both things are true until you open it up and look. Heisenberg took it a step further. Heisenberg said that you can never truly know something. You can never truly measure something, but because by just measuring it, you're going to change it a little bit. And so what all of these guys were saying is more of the uncertainty model. 
You can say that you got a good idea, you know where an electron is, but you can never say for sure the electron is right there. Now we're going to spend a whole lot less time with these guys than we will with the Bohr model. We're going to talk a lot about the Bohr model next week because it's easier to understand. You go to college, you can jump all over these guys and what they're teaching and the, the um, large hadron collider because that's one of the things they're studying now is what makes up atoms. And to do that, you need to smash atoms together going really fast with a whole lot of energy so that they fall apart and then come back together. And in that split second that they fall apart and come back together, they take pictures of it and see what's inside. Now, to get atoms going really, really fast, you need a gun that's going to shoot them really, really fast. How, what type of guns shoot the fastest bullets? What do you need? Well, machine guns, now I'm not talking about the fastest individual bullets. I'm talking about get the bullet going the fastest. You need a gun with a long barrel. The longer the barrel, the faster you can get the bullet. That's why sniper rifles are real long, whereas handguns aren't going to shoot very far away because they don't, they don't get the, butt, the bullet going fast enough. And so what these guys did, they built this huge 30-mile circle underground, 30 miles around, which is pretty much just a long barrel for an atom gun. And they get these atoms going really, really fast towards one another. And then they smash them together going really, really fast. And then they, all the energy knocks them apart. They take pictures of it. They see what's inside. And they tell you more about what's in that atom. So I want to hear about one day when you guys go on to college and are working in, in Europe at the Large Hadron Collider and you found a new part that makes up electrons, protons, and neutrons. Sound good? All right. So hopefully you got everything for your uh, for your chart. If you have any questions, you missed anything, let me know. Tomorrow we will jump on um, electron configuration. Might do some radi radiation tomorrow. We'll have some fun with with an assignment there. Okay, Matthew, you got any questions? I'm gonna cut it, shut it down if you don't. All right, bye bye.